Morning, Journey. How we doing? Man, y'all are, y'all are on it. I love it. Well, hey, uh, miracles are taking place today. I kind of have a rule that if it's under 50 degrees, I don't get out of bed, and yet here I am, and here you are. So God is already moving, and we are in this series called Daily Wisdom, and if you are joining us for the first time, maybe you're joining us online, I uh, want to give a shout out to everybody in Lake County as well. We are in this series, and uh, if you're not familiar, what we're doing is there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, which is a book in the Bible, and there are 31 days in the month of January, so we thought we'd take every single day in the month of January and go and give a message on one of the books or on one of the chapters in Proverbs. So that's what we're doing. So today we're on uh, Proverbs 23. Today's January 23rd, so that's what we're doing. One of the challenges is kind of three-step challenge. One is that you would read a chapter every day that you'd follow along. And when I say a chapter, some of you are like, listen, if it doesn't have pictures, a chapter sounds really long. I promise it's literally less than one page. Like God made the Bible for people that don't like to read. So it's a chapter is less than one page long, so you can do it, and uh, so that would be the first thing. Second thing is, is that you might share maybe a, either something you learned or maybe a key verse from that day on social media, and third thing is don't walk in it alone. Uh, talk to a, a friend, a neighbor, uh, a family member, and kind of go through this together and see what God has in store for you. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Proverbs before this, this series, for me, I've been reading it for a while, and, and, and just the way my brain operates, it just reminds me of a bunch of fortune cookies. Like, like you know when you get a fortune cookie, it's just a great little one-liner? That's what Proverbs is, just one-liner after one-liner, and it looks like they're kind of random, but they're all under the same umbrella, which is wisdom. And, and, and that's the theme of this entire series. That's why it's called Daily Wisdom. As a matter of fact, this is a practice that I've done for several years now is I try to do this throughout the entire calendar year. So some of you, you may think, man, this is really good. What should I do next? You could just do Proverbs every single month of the year because I promise you this, it never gets old. And every time I read it, so, so it could be September 10th and I'm gonna read Proverbs chapter 10. And, and it's just a great way. If you're not sure how to follow along in the Bible, you could just jump in like that. So today we're in Proverbs 23. I'm not gonna read the entire chapter But there are eight verses that I want to highlight that are pretty much the whole theme of the chapter. And I want you, as I read these, I want you to kind of see if there's a commonality between these verses. So the first one is this, Proverbs 23, 2. Put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. So this would be considered rated R, okay? So (laughs) it starts off pretty intense. (laughs) So put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. So the very kind of the, the first subtitle, I would say, is gluttony. Now, my family and I, my, my brothers, my parents, uh, on December 1st, we did a little bit of a contest for 90 days called the Biggest Loser Contest. I don't know if you've ever heard of these. I don't know if you've ever participated in one, but it's our attempt to get healthy and to maybe lose weight and just create some healthy uh, exercising and eating habits. So that started December First. So on December 1st, I have three brothers. So on December 1st, I called one of my brothers, and he didn't pick up the phone. And so that's when I texted him this text message. I said, hey, just calling to let you know Krispy Kreme has a sale going on today. <laughs> if you are judging me, it's because you don't have brothers. So <laughs> if you have brothers, you know what I'm talking about. I spent a, a brief time in Dallas, Texas, and I don't, I don't know what the deal is there, but all their restaurants are buffets. I don't know if you know this. Like every restaurant in Dallas is a buffet. So this verse, I think if there's Christians in Dallas, they just skip this verse. Like I don't know how to do it in Dallas. So first one is gluttony. The second one is this, this verse, uh, 23, verse four and five. Do not weigh yourself out to get rich. Do not trust in your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they're gone. So the first one I would say subcategory would be gluttony. This would be greed. Next verse, do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach on the fields of the fatherless for their defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. I would say this is kind of talking about integrity. Don't don't cheat your way through life. And I I love this part here. Uh, For their defender is strong and and this is with a capital D. It's It's like he's just implying, you know, hey, their defender is strong. I wouldn't mess with them. And who's the defender of the fatherless? God. He's like saying, hey, not only is that not smart, but the defender, he's, he's always gonna win. He's strong. So you may wanna avoid that. Next one, uh, verse 17 and 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, 
but always zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. I would say this has to do with envy. Next one, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. This would be about drunkenness and gluttony again. And then verse 22, listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old. And I would say this talks about pride. Next one, an adulterous woman is a deep pit and a wayward wife is a narrow well. Like a bandit, she lies in wait and multiplies in the, unfaith, the unfaithful among men. And here we talk about lust. And this is the last one, verse 29 through 32. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who, had need, who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. This is highlighted because we're going to talk about this again in a minute. We're going to address this in the end, and we're going to talk about what does in the end look like when it comes to our spiritual journey. So we put all those together. We got gluttony, greed, pride, cheating, envy, lust, drunkenness, and really, it, these are five of the seven deadly sins right here in one chapter. Like literally five of the seven deadly sins that we kind of hear about and know about, and it's right here. And, and really, if I were to kind of do another subcategory of that, it's, it's really lacking self-control is what I would say Proverbs 23 is all about. And when we lack self-control as Christians, it's because we have stopped allowing the Spirit of God to control us, and we have submitted to the flesh, and there's always this flesh versus the spirit of God. And what I want us to talk about is how do we get more and more traction to the spirit of God and less and less to the flesh? And that's where we're gonna be going today, if that's okay with you. And if it's not okay with you, we're still gonna go there. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Food, money, and sex, are those things bad? Yes. No, no, no. It's really important that you understand. It's a no. <laughs> no. You see, food, money, and sex are not bad. We are meant to enjoy them, but within God's proper time and in his proper way. Another way I would say it like this, food, money, and sex are things we are meant to have, but not things that are meant to have us. So let me ask you this. Do you have food or does food have you? Do you have money or does money have you? You. Do you have desires of intimacy or does sexual lust have you? And then we want to come back to Proverbs 23, 32. It says, in the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. In the end. You see, whenever we lack self-control, what we're not thinking about is in the end. We're thinking about today. How do I feel right now? What do I want right now? I need the microwave fix. I need to feel good right now. But we, we forget about in the end and what... What God wants us to do when we make decisions, when we make actions, when we choose attitudes, he's saying, let's think about in the end. And what the proverb is saying, in the end, those ways end up being poisonous, and it's like being snake bitten. Dr. Henry Cloud is a Christian psychologist. He actually has a phrase for this, in the end. He calls it, play the movie. And uh, my father-in-law gave me a book by Dr. Henry Cloud called, Nine Things You Simply Must Do. Now, let me, let me just tell you this. When your father-in-law gives you a book called Nine Things You Simply Must Do, you know you got to read it and then do those nine things, right? And so my father-in-law happens to be here. He's right here and uh, just grateful for the godly wisdom he gives me. And so uh, I, I read the book, so I read it. I read it. I read it. It's good. It's good. Don't ask me any questions, but it was good. He has this concept in the book, one of the chapters is called Play the Movie, and what the, what the idea is, is if you create action step today, like A, right here, what is the domino effect of that? So if you are in an argument and you say something, play the movie out, where is that movie going? So if you were to spend money and, uh, on one day and put something on your credit card, where is that movie going? And then this is what he ends up saying. He says, the good news is if you don't like where the movie's going, you're the producer, you get to make the edits. And so every single leader and every person that's wise makes decisions based on this idea of playing the movie. They don't make decisions based on one scene. They make it based on a movie. 
And so when we're talking about this idea of self-control or drinking or envy or, or gluttony, it's not just about today. It's not just about a meal. It's not just about that one moment. It's about who do I want to be over the next 30, 40, 50 years? Play the end, play the movie, play it out. And if you don't like what you see, you get to make some edits. One of the ways that this is fleshed out is there's this good looking young man, young professional, and he goes to a park with the Wall Street Journal, starts reading it. And he ends up sitting on a bench next to this older gentleman. And some time passes and the younger professional, clean cut, good looking guy, he turns to the older gentleman and he says, hey, he says, do you happen to have the time? And the older gentleman said, he looked at him, he said, no. This confused the young man because he clearly saw a watch and he knew that the watch worked. He could see the watch working, he just couldn't make out the time. And so after being frustrated for a minute or two, he kind of got the attention of the gentleman again. He said, excuse me, sir, I couldn't help but notice your watch works and I asked for the time, you didn't give it to me. Did I do something wrong? And again, the older man kind of looked at him and he said, no. And then just went back and he said, well, hold on. If I didn't do anything wrong, why don't you give me the time? And he kind of sighed and he goes, all right, you want to know? He said, yeah, yeah, tell me. He said, well, when I first saw you approach and sit down on the bench, I thought, here's a good-looking, clean, young professional reading the Wall Street Journal, probably got a good head on his shoulders. And I thought to myself, this is probably a good guy. And he said, as I thought about that, if I were to give you the time, there's a chance because you're a good guy that we strike up a conversation. If you and I struck up a conversation, there's a good chance that we probably meet back here at some point and have another conversation. Over time, you and I would become friends. And he said, well, what's the problem with that? He goes, well, if you and I become friends, there's a good chance that at some point I'm gonna invite you over to my house and we're gonna have dinner. And when I have dinner, I'm probably gonna introduce you to my daughter who's single and she's attractive and she's great. And I think because, I think because you're a young, good-looking professional, there's a good chance she's gonna go on a date with you. And because she's gonna go on a date and she probably sees what I see in you, nothing but good things, y'all probably gonna fall in love and get married. And he said, he said, it'll be over my dead body before I let my daughter marry someone that doesn't own a watch. You see, all great leaders, they play the movie. That might be a little extreme. Wise people often think about how their actions today impact their plans for tomorrow. Dr. Henry Cloud said, you never know exactly what might happen on down the line when you make any given choice, but the wise person at least thinks about it. The Bible says it like this, Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. A man reaps what he sows. So we, we, we can't plant a banana seed, I don't even know if that's a real thing. You can't plant whatever makes a banana tree and expect a, an apple tree. And we do this. We make decisions one day and expect different results. And God says, no, 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 you can't, you can't mock the heart of God. We will reap what we sow. Dr. Henry Cloud goes on to say, sowing and reaping is about what I will ultimately end up with if I sow this particular behavior, choice, attitude, value, or strategy. And wise people evaluate almost everything they do in this way. There's a young lady in her early 30s worked at a bank and she hated it. The reason she hated it wasn't because of the role at the bank, it was because she hadn't, in the depths of her heart, she just always wanted to be a teacher. And so one day she's kind of confessing this once again to her counselor and the counselor is kind of unpacking all of this that she just hates her job, which she works eight hours a day at. And, and finally the counselor just says, hey listen, why don't you become a teacher if that's really what's in your heart? And she says, oh, I can never do that. It would just take too long. He said, okay, how long would that take? And she said, well, probably to go back to school and everything would probably take three or four years. And she's in her, she's maybe 32-ish at the time. And he goes, okay, let me ask you this. Do you plan to be alive in three to four years? She kind of, well, yeah, I hope so. I hope I'm gonna be alive. And so he said, play the movie out. In four years, what do you want your life to be like? And she says, oh, well, I'd love to be happy. I'd love to be a teacher. I'd love to be this and that. He goes, well, it's never gonna happen in four years. He said, let me tell you the movie that you're actually living in and playing. He goes, for the next 40 years, you're gonna be miserable eight hours a day because you don't wanna invest in the next three to four because you will get there. The question is, are you gonna get there on purpose? You see, all of us are gonna get there at some point. The question is, are you gonna get there on purpose? And I would say this, you can't change everything, but you can change something. And this is what I love about the serenity prayer. It says this, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, 
the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You can't change everything, but you can change something. Play, play the movie. Play the movie with, with your actions. Play the movie with your relationships. If you keep doing the relationships you've been doing, where is that movie ending? Play the movie with your finances. If you keep spending the way you do, where does that movie end? If you keep handling your finances that way. Play the movie with your attitude, with your parenting. If you play that movie over, where does it end? Do you like it? If you like it, great, stick to the script. If not, you get to change the script. That's the beauty. You see, the the conversation we're talking about today is being controlled by the flesh or the spirit, and Paul talks about this in Romans 8, verse five and six. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And then it goes on to say in verse 18 of chapter eight, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So what he's saying is that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What's he doing? He's playing the movie. You see, Paul in Romans 8 is playing the movie. He's saying, hey, what's going on today? I have a plan because what we're doing today is gonna make a beautiful ending. Just don't give up. There's gonna be glory at the end. Uh, Galatians 5.22 says this, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So in this, what we're talking about is we can either be led by the flesh or led by the spirit. And, and here it says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, the thing I know about fruit is fruit never tries to grow. It just does. You see, fruit is a byproduct. It's not an effort, hardworking thing. It's just the way God's created it. So when it talks about the fruit and how do we get self-control? By having fruit from the spirit. And how do we get fruit from the spirit? We're gonna get there. But it's not by self-help. It's not by hard work. You don't just muster up more energy to be able to get fruit. That's not how it works. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, somewhere around there, there was this uh, thing called the marshmallow test. I don't know if any of y'all saw this, heard of this. There was some videos, some books, some leadership, leadership stuff created out of it. And the whole idea, if you're not familiar with it, is they would stick a kid in a room, most of the time by himself, and they would put one marshmallow in front of him. Kid would range anywhere from four to eight years old. They'd put a marshmallow in front of him and say, now listen, you could eat that marshmallow if you want, or if you wait till I get back, I'm gonna give you two marshmallows. And they would record them and some of the clips are hilarious from kids just, you know, licking the entire thing and putting it back to kids smelling it, to kids kind of like doing this as if it doesn't exist, to kids eating half of it and then pretending like nothing happened. You know, they're even creating the same shape and thinking that it maybe just got smaller. And they asked one kid before he went in, they, they said, what do you think an intelligent child would choose? And the child said, oh, well, he would wait. And the adult said, well, what will you do? Oh, I'll take it now. (laughs) The study concluded this. Self-control is crucial for the successful pursuit of long-term goals. Self-control is crucial for the successful pursuit of long-term goals. I want to introduce you to my son, Riley. Yeah, that was when he was cute. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So Riley's my only son and my firstborn. And before Riley, I I had no concept of babies. And when I say no concept, I mean no concept. None. And so after we came home from the hospital, I changed him for the very first time. It was horrible. Like, I mean, absolutely horrible. I was disgusted. I hated everything about it. And I looked to my wife and I say, this is horrible. I was like, how long do we have to do this? A couple weeks, a month? I kid you not, true story. She looked at me as if marrying me was the biggest mistake of her life. And she's like, she said, are you serious? I was like, what? She's like, we have to do this for years. 
I was like, are you kidding? Seriously, absolutely horrible. I hated everything about it. And so at that point, I had a goal in life. Get my kid potty trained as fast as possible. (laughs) You see, when you and I are born, we are born 100% dependent on other people. 100%. My son couldn't do anything. Now my son's 18 years old. This is my son, Riley. Riley. My son's 18 years old. He's a couple months away from graduation. Yay. And, uh, <laughs> and he's about to graduate. And he feels called into full-time vocational ministry. Yay. It's cool. And so one of the things he's praying through that you can lean in and pray for as well is that he, he's looking to land a job uh, at this camp that he's in uh, right here in this picture in North Georgia to do both ministry and leadership and at the same time do online school. And so in a couple months, though, he's going to graduate. And by the way, I did a really good job of potty training. He's almost done. (laughs) Like, we're so close. I got two more months. (laughs) Here's the deal. Riley's about to graduate, and when he graduates, it's my job, along with his mom, my wife, it is our job to make sure that he is ready for the real real world. And our job was to take somebody that was 100% dependent on us and to help them be 100% independent. You see, that's what, humanly speaking, that's what it's about, is to go from being 100% dependent to independent. And before I go on, I just got to tell you, as a dad, I'm just so proud of my son. And my son, Riley's right here. And Riley, I just want you to know I love you, and I'm grateful for you. I'm really proud of you. And if you think the potty training thing is big, he's got a lot of other skills that he's learned as well, and I'm excited. <laughs> it's really good. So here's the thing, guys. Listen, listen. Humanly speaking, the way we grow in maturity the way we grow into adults is to go from being dependent, that's how we're born, to independent. But spiritually, it's the exact opposite. You see, spiritually, we start off independent. We start off completely separate from God, completely doing our own thing, and God, I can do it all on my own, I don't need you. But spiritual maturity in the spiritual world is when you become 100% dependent on him. That is the the, the paradox of the Christian life, is in this whole process is what maturity is actually about. And so my prayer for you and for me is that we would grow from being independent, that God, I can do this on my own, and if you wanna come along, that's great too. God, I can't do anything apart from you. God, I am 100% dependent on you and you alone, and I need you. I need you today, I need you to breathe, I need you to love, I need, I, I can't live a day without you. That's what John 15, five says, apart from you, I can do nothing, nothing. And then it goes on to say, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you could ask for whatever you wish and it will be done. This is, my, this is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So there's that word fruit again. And how do we get the fruit according to John 15, 5 is by abiding in Christ. The way that we get self-control is by getting fruit. The way we get fruit is by sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's not a, a work harder, it's a come closer. It's not it's all on you, it's all on him. And so we don't go and live this life tomorrow, wake up and go, hey, I'm gonna make this day a great day. No, no, no. I'm gonna lean into God and I'm gonna ask God, God, by your grace, would it be a great day? because I can't do anything apart from you. It's not independent. Christian life is not about being independent. It's about being dependent on the creator of all things. I have a friend of mine. I may have shared a little bit of his story before. It's my favorite text I ever get. Every now and then he'll send me this photo. It's an updated photo and it's his sobriety chip. This is his nine month chip. You see, a year ago he didn't have any chips. Now he's got a pocket full of chips. And he had nine months, maybe a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. And however, last week, maybe two weeks ago, it was a rough week. He got into a car accident. 
And you, you don't get between a man and his truck if you don't know that, okay? So this is his truck. And so here he is on a bad day, and if, if you've never had any problems or any addictions or struggles like this, when, when you're doing good, it might seem easy, but when you have a bad day, there's almost a knee-jerk reaction to, to reach back for what you used to reach to. And he had a bad day, and he had an accident, and so he reached for something. And a year earlier, what he would have reached for would have been a bottle, but this time he reached out for a cell phone, and he called me. And he said, hey, Dustin, I just got into an accident. He said, I just needed to talk to somebody. I needed to vent a little bit, and maybe we could pray together. You see, one day he used to reach for a bottle, and now he's reaching for a friend, for prayer, and to God. And let me just tell you, I know that he is working hard on everything, but where he's at today is not because of how hard he's working. Where he's at today is because he's been abiding in the Father. Where he's at today is because every single... Where he's at today is because every single Sunday I see him sitting right here leaning into the words of God. He's where he's at today because he's leaning into scripture. He's leaning into prayer like never before. It's not, a, it's not a work harder to come closer. And over the past year, he's come closer and closer to Jesus. And where he's been moving is independent living to fully dependent on Christ. And because of that, his life is changing. And because of that, his marriage and his family is changing. And I wonder if maybe we all need to make a shift today. Maybe it's just one step. Maybe you're here and you need to go here. Maybe you're here and you just need to go here. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, man, I've been trying to do this completely on my own for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And I never realized this, this paradigm shift that it's not about me doing it on my own with God, but it's, it's in being fully dependent on him. And maybe today's the day you need to completely surrender your life to Jesus. Because that's what hands up means. It's a universal sign of surrender saying, God, I'm dependent 100% on you. I can't do this life alone, and I don't want to. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for my buddy. I thank you first for keeping him safe in that car accident, and I thank you that I thank you that he reached for a cell phone and not for a bottle. And God, I know there are gonna be days and weeks and different situations of temptation, not just for him, but for all of us. And God, would you help us to, to stop thinking it's a work harder, that, that it's on us, it's all on us, and would you help us to realize it's a come closer, that God, it's, it's in a life that is dependent on you that we shine, that, we, that we, our lives are changed and, and are full of grace and love and peace and joy. And so, God, I pray for the person that's in here today, and they've been trying for years and years and years to do it on their own. And today, it's just an epiphany. They realize they can't do it apart from you. So, God, I pray for full surrender for that person today, that they wouldn't walk out of here without fully surrendering their life to you from going from independent to fully dependent. And, God, it's in full surrender to you that you wrap your arms, your loving joyful, grace-filled arms around us. And God, I thank you for my son, Riley, who blesses me, his mom, and so many other people. And God, would you help us to follow in his footsteps of going from being fully dependent to independent. God, individually and collectively, we come to you today and say, we we can't do it and we don't want to do it apart from you. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.